what um, what uh, Lynn has said in the last period, Lyndon LaRouche, is that America is a sleeping giant. And you heard uh, Tori's uh, briefing where, uh, I mean, we are now in a situation, and I hope to be able to, before I leave, actually give you guys a brief report, a half-hour report about the international work that we are doing, which I'm involved in very intensively uh, in New York with the United Nations missions. Uh, because there's a tremendous openness, and people know, I mean, uh, China, Russia, I just met with a Chinese gentleman here last week in L.A. The Chinese, the Indonesians, uh, the people from Sudan, Russia, uh, the Balkan areas, Iran, and so forth and so on, people outside the United States, they know that uh, we are in a situation now where it's either hell or we have something drastic happening, a, a major change. And whenever you talk with them, and say, well, it's absolutely necessary that the United States is part of the solution. They look at you and say, huh, United States, I mean, this is not a nice nation. They are bombing people. They have wiretapping. They're endorsing torture. I mean, the anti-Americanism uh, abroad is huge. So um, because uh, people don't know, as most Americans don't know, what is the very special about American uh, America and American culture. So, and what is it? I mean, what is this sleeping giant uh, that LaRouche is talking about? So what I'm going to do tonight is to just use a few pedagogicals uh, to give a sense of that sleeping giant. Uh, and I'm not going to, some of it is going to be pretty direct, some of it is going to be indirect. And I'm not going to talk about uh, Lincoln, I'm not going to talk about John Quincy Adams or uh, FDR. I'm just going to take a few pedagogicals uh, to give this example because there's actually many, uh, to Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, I'm not going to mention that uh, almost at all. Um, uh, and I think, let's just get going. Uh, the absolute key, what Tori also brought up, the absolute key uh, is the ideas upon which the United States was founded. And that was ideas that people in Europe had fought for for two and a half thousand years. That is, that there's something very special about man, that man is the living image of the creator, that there's, certain, that there's a, such a thing as human dignity, that man is born with inalienable rights. And uh, the founding of the United States was uh, to be, when we talk about the United States as be, being a beacon of hope, this is, a, this is real. Uh, this is uh, that, that uh, the find, founding of the United States was not just to be for the United States, but was for, to be uh, leading the rest of the world to become, uh, to, to be governed by the same principles. That is the inalienable rights of man and the general welfare. We are not there yet, but that is the absolutely crucial principle which makes that these ideas was fought for and won originally makes America very, very special. Okay, you can hear, those of you that know, don't know me, that I have an accent, so I come from Europe. And uh, I worked a lot with Asians, and there is a huge difference between Asians, Europeans, and Americans. I mean, Americans are ignorant, they are not very aesthetically trained. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, you don't have any beautiful cities, and, and all this kind of stuff. But uh, when you are here for a while, you realize there's something very special, and it, it's difficult to get hold of. There's something very special in the United States and with Americans. And so let us lo look at it a little bit. Huh? And I'm going to give a pedagogic example. Uh, let us just wait. Um, so uh, I would like to take you back to uh, 1776, uh, before we had the uh, Declaration of Independence. You have had uh, the battles in Lexington, Concord. You had had Bunkers Hill, all happening in, in 1775. The British had occupied, uh, or had been yeah, occupied the United States. At the, it was not a United States at that time, but the America. Uh, what, could, what do you call it? North America, um, the colonies uh, for 15 months. At, at Boston had been under siege for 11 months, and the. Uh, Washington came up and they succeeded in 
uh, uh, sending the British away. And in all 13 colonies, all the British governors and so forth were ousted. And people were really happy. They thought, okay, great. Now we are rid of those Brits forever. Uh, and Washington, uh, right after the British are taking their boats and sailing off from Boston, and everybody are happy and think this is it, uh, Washington sends a letter to Congress in March of 76, say, I don't think so. I think uh, the British are planning to come back to New York, and if they get a foothold in New York, I think it would be very difficult to get rid of them. So, and he prepared accordingly because he thought the British was not uh, going to be gone uh, forever or for very long. And actually, it turns out later on, uh, when you get the plans from the British that long before Lexington, long before Bunkers Hill and so forth, the British had plans for a major invasion and were planning a major invasion into the colonies. While they were doing all these other things, they were planning and building up troops and arm, uh, artillery and so forth to send over and invade the colonies. So, so Washington was right because... Oh, yeah, yeah. Because in, uh, here we go, a quiet summer day in June 29th, 1776, the British come, this is a drawing of it, it's not very impressive, but the British are coming to New York, and this is huge. Um, they have, um, in six weeks, that is uh, July and half of August, you have 500 transport ships with all kinds of foods, artillery, tents, whatever the troops are going to use, 500 transport ships. You have 23,000 British regular troops arriving, plus 10,000 German troops, plus thousands of women and workers to kind of help them to cook, to clean, and so forth. And then, plus all that, you had 15,000 troops arriving that are going from uh, New York up to Canada. So this is huge. This is actually half the fleet uh, of uh, Britain. And it's the largest invasion ever at that time. They used half uh, the, their power to invade uh, the colonies. It's a little bit like you think about They were really stretching themselves out, a little bit like the United States now stretching ourselves out with uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and uh, now trying to create a war in Iran and so on. So it's it's really huge, and there's never been anything seen like that. And they built up their camps, uh, very uh, clean, very regulated. Everything functions. They have everything, like, uh, online. They are also very well trained. Uh, they know how to march, not only to march to drums, but they have these drums, and then uh, they, the drums can give... Um, can give messages, you split up in two, you go to the left, you advance on the right. So just through hearing the drums, they were very eloquent in that you can figure out marching orders, uh, what the troops should be doing. And although this, what I'm going to go through now, might seem a little bit tedious, uh, I will do it anyway because it's very helpful. At least I find it's very helpful to give a little sense of the troops on the British side and the American side the Americans, the rebels, and then the British. So on the British side, you had 15 generals. Okay. They were an average of 48 years old, and they had an average of 30 years in service. And then they had the infantry, they had an average of nine years in service. So the generals are 30 years in service, the infantry, nine years in service. The rebels... 21 generals, the average age was 43 years old. They had an average experience of two years. So to the British, 30 years, they had an average of two years. And the infantry, the American infantry, I mean, they, was, they were just coming out from the woods. Uh, this is just a few months. Uh, no training whatsoever. They didn't know how to march to drums or anything like that. And um, we have uh, this guy. Uh, General Howe, uh, he is the one who is leading the British troops. Actually, Benjamin Franklin had had many weeks-long discussions in London to see, we, together with Benjamin, uh, they, Howe didn't really want to go and attack the colonies, but 
it didn't succeed. This is a whole story in itself. So he's leading the, leading the British, and he's a guy who is in complete control. He doesn't ask anybody about anything. He decides from the top down uh, what's going to happen uh, and what next moves and so on. And then, of course, to take the other side too, you have Washington, who is completely opposite. Washington is famous, and he's learning more and more. He has to because the Americans are so wild to uh, have war council calling in people, uh, whether they're 19 year old, whether it's farmers out from the countryside. He's very famous for calling people to councils for what do you think? We, uh, I have these ideas and these proposals come up. What do you think? And then he'll hear all the ideas, and then based upon that, he'll take his decision. So it's a very different way of uh, being a leader. Then you have. Um, um, Let's just take, I, unfortunately, I could find m much more drawings and pictures of the British than I could of the Americans. So because they were much more organized and there was pictures from a long time ago of these guys. But here you have the dramas, and uh, you can see they're really fitted out and so on. Um, these are the Highlanders. They're this from the people from Scotland, from where 65,000 65, Scots were enlisted on behalf of the British and a huge amount of them came here. And they were like in it for life. To be a soldier was like something you were for life. Uh, and you got money, and that's how you lived. Um, and there's some very funny stories about them, but I'll just quickly go on. Um, then you have the Hessian soldiers. A large amount of the soldiers that came over the bridge were Hessian soldiers. And they were really trained like Hessian is a part also today of Germany. And they were really trained like Spartans uh, from they were very little. It was a, the whole uh, nation was built upon that the wealth uh, came from uh, a, 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 a number of the young men simply being uh, used by the British. And then the leaders in Hessen got money for, uh, for those soldiers. So you had when, uh, so the whole Hessen uh, society was about war and about being warriors. So when all the males in Hessen were seven years old, they were registered. And then when they were 16, all males in Hessen was come, came to an interview where then you have a few of them that were indispensable. That means the people a little bit higher up in the society in Hessen. And then you had the, the dispend, what do you call it, expendables. And they were the ones that was used for cannon fodder. Uh, and they were trained that this was honor, this was something good. Like the Spartans, they didn't think something bad about it. Uh, and they were very, very brutal. They had a very brutal discipline and every, everything for duty. So that is the uh, British side. Oh, there's a couple of things. They have, they're very famous with their horse, horse troops. Um, light infantry, you can see they're all made up there. And there you have, so on the rebel side, of course, you have Washington, who's really famous for being like one with his horse. Uh, and since I used to ride a lot, I get a kick out of that. Um, so, uh, so Washington is the key leader. You'll get to him more. And then you have Hamilton. Very, very, who ended up in the first um, cabinet with Washington, as you know. Very key in the Revolutionary War. And Lafayette, 19 years old, Lafayette, comes from France. He pays everything for himself. And actually, Washington is somewhat upset about all the people from Europe that comes over who wants to be part of the Revolutionary War, these counts and so forth. And they, when they are counts and have all these titles from Europe, they expect that they are going to be officers in Washington's army. And he has had it with these Europeans. He said, I don't want any more of those, and so on. But Lafayette comes, and he's a very pushy guy. And as soon as he has an encounter with Washington, Washington realizes that he's something special, and they become like a family. He becomes, Lafayette becomes like uh, Washington's adopted son. But more about that later. Then we have a guy. Uh, uh, Knox, who is actually quite slender there because he's supposed to be 300 pounds. And he's also a bass, which is very important for the crossing of Delaware. He has a gigantic voice. 
And uh, he's very uh, good because, he, uh, very special. He's, uh, he's really what I think about concerning American ingenuity because he produces artillery like crazy and totally out, uh, outdo, outdoors, can you say that? Mm-hmm. Outdoors uh, the British concerning artillery and he makes all kinds of inventions because in artillery at that time is very heavy. So if you have really heavy wagons to this heavy artillery, you cannot move. But one of the things with the Americans is speed. They don't have a lot of other stuff, but that's one of the things they have, they have speed. So he makes the artillery very light and he builds tons of it. So this is Knox, very important. Then you have New England soldiers. Oh no, very important guy also, Colonel Glover. Uh, who uh, has a very famous Massachusetts 14th Regiment, uh, Marbleheads here. And uh, this is uh, blacks, uh, Indians, fishermen, a really tough bunch. And uh, there's a, you can imagine in the beginning, which I'll come to in a second, there's quite some. I mean, America at that time is... Washington has really problems in the beginning when he has to get all these different people. So you have the marble heads. And then uh, he has New England soldiers. And I just want to tell you, okay, let's, uh, let me just give you a quote. What, so he has the marble heads. He has New England soldiers. And here's what he talks about the New England, New England soldiers. This is a quote from George Washington. The officers, generally speaking, are the most indifferent kind of people I ever saw. They are an exceeding, dir- exceeding dirty and nasty people. And he also often compare, uh, complains about their levering spirit of New England, where, quote, the principles of democracy are so universally, they so universally prevail. I mean, you have to see, Washington is a gentleman. He's used to his estate down in Virginia and so forth, and he has these New Englander that believe in totally in the equality of man and so forth. So he has to deal with them. He has to deal with the marbleheads. Then he has the riflemen from the back country. And uh, is that, yeah, see, this is just made up pictures because you don't have these drawings like what you had from the, from the British. You have a long rifle back country shirtmen from Western Virginia. And they made the first camouflage they uh, dyed their, uh, they dyed their, uh, uh, their clothes in, in uh, leaves and so forth from the wood. And already at that time, there was a proposal to Congress, to U.S. Congress at that time, that all soldiers should have camouflage because this is really good. So the camouflage comes from 1775, 1776, the idea about camouflage. Um, you have, I have some pictures of them. I don't think they're so satisfactory. They just, they don't look like the British, you know. This is uh, the rebels' uh, horse troops. This is like kind of somewhat also the long riflemen. Uh, I should go back. So there is a, uh, there is an explanation how they look like these, um, some of these guys that he has to deal with. Um, you have the backcountry guys from the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. They call themselves Culpepper Minute, Minute, Minute Men. And here's how they look like. They are men with bucktails in their heads and tomahawks or scalping knives in their belts. And they are, have strong brown linen hunting shirts dyed with leaves and the words liberty or death in large white letters on their breast. And they have, their weaponry is fowling pieces and squirrel guns. And one of them describes, he, when he wrote his memoirs, he described that the people hearing that we came from the backwoods and seeing our savage looking equipments seemed as much as afraid of us as if we had been Indians. So, um, let me see if there's, uh, so then he also talks about the Philadelphia Associates, the soldiers coming, because this is go way back to uh, 1757 when Benjamin Franklin formed the first militia in Philadelphia. There you had the Philadelphia Associates. This was wealthy guys who equipped themselves, they paid for their clothes, they paid for their guns and so forth. 
And um, they believe in no distinction uniform, everybody is equal. And this is also a little bit, I mean, you have to just imagine all these different types. Um, I sometimes think about that when I heard when LaRouche was uh, training the guys um, to the Second World War where he said he came in, in came this motley crew of all these different people he had to kind of get into shape. He also has from Maryland, he has the so-called silk stocking regiments. And you should see these descriptions of these guys, how they look like with their silk stockings and the pants that goes to here and they're real fans and everything is matching in colors. You know, the, the stockings with the shirt and the pants with the hats and so forth. And um, uh, what they do have, uh, the Amer so immediately, um, I mean, when all these guys are being gathered, you have a big brawl very fast because you have some of the guys from Virginia who are slaveholders, and then you have the uh, Marbleheads. And in a matter of no time, one of these days, they get into fight. So you have uh, more people involved in a fight, a couple of thousand, within five minutes than you had up in Lexington fighting each other. And here you have George Washington coming in on his horse together with his uh, black servant, uh, William Lee, and George Washington just throws his, um, uh, I don't know what you call it in English, what you hold the horse with? The, the, the reins, he just throws it to William, and he jumps down, and he takes two of the biggest guys, and just hold, George Washington's very big, as you know, so he just holds them up, and in a matter of two minutes, he stopped this whole brawl. And so from the very beginning, people got a pretty, got pretty much respect for him, but he also were pretty freaked out in the beginning about what he had to deal with. He, I mean, this was a real motley crew. So, and the Americans are dirty. I know they're not dirty, but their camps are dirty. It's not like the British camp that are regulated. They have all the women. They have all the workers they had taken from, from England to take care of them. No, this is a, a, a young men coming, fathers, brothers, sons, and so forth. They come from different parts of the colonies to fight for, for the, the liberty of the United States. And uh, they don't have anybody to take care of them, so they're kind of setting up camp. It's not regulated. It's dirty, which is a problem uh, when you have a lot of people living together because you get maggots and ants and diseases and things like that. So uh, in this period, you have uh, the Declaration of Independence has been uh, fought for, has been agreed upon. And the July the 9th, it is being read up in all the units in Washington's army and has a very big effect that this, okay, this is like a, a uh, gathering document, the Declaration of Independence. Um, and that's after, and uh, right after there, you have, as you know, uh, people get really excited. Uh, Washington is actually a little bit nervous because he's thinking, my God, do I have a Jacobin mob on my hands? He doesn't call them Jacobins, obviously, but he is a little bit nervous about the crowd. This is the crowd in New York City tearing down the statue of George III. And as you probably know how uh, the metal from the statue was used to, to produce bullets. There was women up in Connecticut that produced bullets uh, for the Revolutionary War made out of the statue of George III. We have a little bit of other more delicate uh, George III. Here he is. Um, so uh, you have five months. <laughs> Can I get a glass of water, please? We have five months of cold. Uh, five <laughs> <laughs> There's five months of battle in uh, New York, uh, which is a whole uh, class in itself. And every single battle, uh, George Washington loses. I mean, and, and the rebels loses. Battle after battle after battle. Five months. The British are just sweeping the floor with the Americans, just sweeping the floor. And uh, the Americans get, uh, begin to uh, retreat from New York. And uh, when New York falls, there are several descriptions, eyewitness descriptions, of George Washington standing, looking over New York, and he cries really deep. And some of these descriptions of him doing it say, my God, is this our leader? Uh, how can we have such a leader who stands there and cries? But there's also descriptions how he pulls himself together. And from that moment, the entire battle changes. Uh, he has learned, I mean, one of the things, great, 
One of the things you had in these first five months, well, it was very new. Everything was very new. It was a complete, like, runover. But also, the Americans' intelligence stunk. So George Washington learns from the experience, and he begins to recruit his own agents and intelligence officers and so forth. A lot of it we still don't know about because they were so secret that um, there's all kinds of exciting stuff to dig up around that. So um, uh, what you have is that the Americans have lost 90% of their strengths in those five months. So here you have all these British, uh, they're coming in, Americans lose battle after battle, 90% of artillery, guns, uh, people that has been wounded and so forth, 90% of the American forces. That's when Washington cries in his stand because if you think about who George Washington was, it's also, oh my God, I mean, how are we going to do this? So, and uh, on the, on the, uh, on the um, retreat to New Jersey, you have, let's just take a map, it's not very good. Oh, sorry, this is Thomas Paine. On the retreat to New Jersey, you have a guy in his 40s, Thomas Paine. He's a Quaker, and he's made a lot of uh, propaganda that war there must, is bad, there should be another way of solving problems than war. Uh, and, uh, but this is too much. So he writes a pamphlet on the retreat uh, in November uh, into New Jersey. He writes a pamphlet and it's called The American Crisis. And he, every time he's uh, on his way, he has a little break, he writes in this pamphlet, and he comes to Philadelphia, and it takes him 10 days to find a printer because people are scared shitless. Everybody has fled, everything is closed down, boarded up. It takes him 10 days to get a printer, get him to reopen his shop and print this pamphlet. And I was going to have um, uh, Rachel read a couple of quotes from that pamphlet. First from the very beginning, it's a very famous beginning. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. The heart that feels not now is dead. The blood of his children will curse his cowardice, who shrinks back at a time when a little might have saved the whole and made them happy. I love the man that can smile in trouble, that can gather strength from distress, and grow brave by reflection. Tis the business of little minds to shrink, but he whose heart is firm and whose conscience approves his conduct will pursue his principles unto death. So this is just two excerpts of this, um, the American Crisis paper. And this was um, immediately read at every single unit uh, in Washington's army. And it had an electrifying effect. It, it remoralized the entire uh, Washington army, this pamphlet, uh, The American Crisis, that uh, Thomas Paine had written. And um, so uh, they retreat. Oh, this is the American Crisis paper. You can actually find it and read the whole thing on the, um, on the internet. You can find it there. But in the, on the internet, it's called The Crisis. It's really called The American Crisis, but the internet is under The Crisis. This is not so clear, but just you get a little sense. Here you have New York. So 
you had um, the Americans uh, fleeing and the British following them. And they're going all the way down here. And they're just going very fast, just fleeing, fleeing, fleeing. And you have the population in New Jersey are very scared. Uh, a number of them go over to the British uh, Hackensack, where we have our office in New Jersey. They are really scared. They go over to the British right away, supporting them and so forth. People are very scared. And uh, you have an occupation of New Jersey where you have complete uh, bar barbarism from the British, plunder and rape, where they rape, um, I mean, they just go in and they take everything they have. Normally, you would, uh, the rules, so to speak, are that you go in and take, if you need some food, you go in and take some food, but you leave some for the family, not the British, they take everything. And uh, not only that, they just make, they have these gangs of British soldiers that go out and just knocking on the doors, uh, banging in there and just uh, to go for all the women they possibly can find and uh, gang rape them. And they don't hold back for anything. They go for uh, uh, old uh, people. I mean, you have, you no, know, you have this woman who's 70 years old uh, who uh, they raped for days on end. You had one that was in her eight months. Another one was a 10-year-old girl who was raped for six days, a gang raped for six days. And uh, so forth, um, and I don't want to go more into details with that, but that means that uh, with that, the population gets uh, very upset, uh, to put it mildly, uh, very, very scared. But you have a situation where if you have leadership and people that are organizing with ideas how to overcome that, people are ready to act. I just wanted to put that out because in the beginning they're just scared, and then you have all this rape and plundering, and um, people want to do something if they have an idea about what to do about it. So uh, you have there's all these stories about uh, what I'm going to go through as a little bit of a case example how uh, the situation today can be turned around is uh, Washington crossing Delaware uh, to go and attack Trenton. And there is these stories that go in most history books that this was Christmas night, and uh, the reason this was chosen Christmas night is that then the Hessians would all be sleeping and drunk and been eating a lot, and it'll be easy for the Americans to uh, attack them and to take them over. This is not true. Uh, the guy who was leading the Hessians, a guy called Ral, R-A-L-L, -L, he had been warned on a number of occasions just before it happened that this, uh, that something was up from spies and so forth, that something was being planned to attack Trenton. And he had, uh, uh, some of these were deserters from the American army and so forth. So one, uh, so what he had, Ral, he had one regiment under arms day and night. And the outposts outside of Trenton, they were extra manned and were, had shifts day and night. And those guys, they were sleep everybody was sleeping with, when they slept, they were sleeping with full equipment, f uh, full uh, with uh, guns and so forth on them. And um, so uh, also uh, the only thing that uh, you can have as a little thing regarding them being surprised was that the weather was incredible. And I'll come to this in a second. Um, when Washington has decided that he's going from, from uh, here to cross over to go into Trenton, Trenton is here, I know this is not very clear, um, he, uh, he's not so sure what's going to happen. Uh, he sends, this guy is Robert Morris. Robert Morris was the key guy in funding the Revolutionary War. Every time it looked really bleak, George Washington would turn to Robert Morris. One time, actually, he convinced a Quaker to go out in the backyard and dig a hole up, and there was a whole bunch of um, cash that could be used for the soldiers to buy blankets and food and so forth. And he actually ended up in debt prison after the Revolutionary War. But this was a key guy uh, in Philadelphia uh, fundraising for the Revolutionary War. And Washington writes to him, before they go to Alter Trent, before they cross the Delaware, Washington writes to him, 
that uh, a, that a message has been uh, intercepted from a person in the secrets of the enemy. And this seems to indicate that British commanders were planning to cross the Delaware as soon as the ice is sufficiently strong. This is Washington. I mention this that you may take the necessary steps for the security of such public and private property as ought not to fall into their hands should they make themselves masters of Philadelphia. So before Washington crosses the Delaware, he writes this to uh, Morris, not sure that uh, indeed uh, this will succeed, that the British might, uh, they might not be able to do it, the Delaware will freeze over and the, um, uh, the British will march towards Philadelphia. So nobody uh, knows really what's going to happen except for the officers. There's total secret about what's going to happen. And there's going to be four different crossings. Up here, this is Washington, this is the main crossing. Here, here, and down here. So here, 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 and here. You don't need to know all the details. Um, and uh, the uh, idea is that, uh, the plan is that what all these groups are going to do on Christmas, uh, just the, the evening for Christmas, is they're going to gather on the banks uh, on this side, so, uh, but away from the river so nobody can see them. They're going to gather there at four. This is, the sun goes down pretty early in December. So uh, they're going to gather there, make everything ready, and soon as the sun has set, they're going to cross the river and then gather on the other side and be in Trenton before daybreak. That's the plan. That you go, uh, they have to march up here, and they go down here, and I'll explain a little bit more about this is going to happen. Um, what the plan is, is that one brigade will go fur uh, faster than the others, go to Trenton, secure an area three miles around Trenton so that nobody can go in and out. Everybody is being arrested and uh, hold back, whether it's pregnant women going to the midwife or whatever it is. Everybody are being arrested so nobody can come in and warn the people in Trenton, what's going to happen. And um, you have uh, uh, different things we are going in details. People that are got special troops that are going to attack the Hessian guards outside of um, uh, uh, Trenton. Because all of Trenton, this is the Hessians right there. They're brutal. They are Spartan soldiers. So the idea is overman them uh, outside of Hessen. They have these outposts, overman them and take them on. And the third uh, thing that's going to happen is that the main body, so you have these groups going in beforehand doing these different things, and the main body are going to encircle Trenton uh, from the north, from here, and from the south, so that they will attack from all sides Trenton at the same time. Before the sun, just when the sun goes up, they are already ready, and they will attack Trenton in a total surprise. Uh, what you have is knobs. He has been really busy. He has been making sure the Europe, uh, that to have a lot of artillery so that for each thousand infantry, the Americans have seven to eight pieces of artillery. The Europeans have two to three, which is going to be very important in the entire Revolutionary War, uh, the firepower uh, of uh, the Americans, uh, which is the same as you had in the Second World War. Um, and... Uh, uh, so, okay, so they begin, but they are behind. Uh, they are totally behind schedule. And um, uh, Washington is really, uh, he's, uh, you have, when they begin to march, you have people uh, joining from the countryside militia, people asking, can I help, and so forth, and they told, sure, just join us. But what you have is a horrific weather. You have a, what you call, I don't know uh, how many of you are from the East Coast, but you have something called a Northeaster, a Nor'easter, which is brutal. It is like sleet and snow and hail, and it's really hefty wind, uh, close to hurricane winds, and you can't, uh, you can't, uh, you know, you just stay indoors. <laughs> and uh, the Delaware, huh? 
Yeah, this is in December here, and it is like really hefty, so that um, within four hours you can have several feet of ice uh, packing the Delaware River. And this means that two places here and here, they simply cannot go over. It's impossible for them to go over. And many of you have probably heard about the crossing, which was uh, horrific uh, uh, regarding ice and um, uh, snow and so forth. It's very famous with, um, I mean, for example, at one point up here, you have 150 yards from the shore, you have just ice. And people had to figure out to get through it. Many people say when they see this famous painting with George Washington, they're all standing up. Well, first of all, there was no seats in these boats. Secondly, they were half full with ice water. So even if there were seats, you wouldn't like to put uh, your, your butt into it. So, and one of the key things with the crossing up here is Knox. He writes to his wife, this was an impossible thing. I thought we couldn't do it. But his voice is so big. He's in command of getting people over. His voice is so big, he has this big bass voice. So people can hear him through the storm, uh, giving the commanders and getting over. And not one single, none of the Americans can swim. Uh, not one single one dies on the crossing. Everybody gets over. With artillery, everything. Uh, horses to drag the artillery. So everybody gets over. Nobody dies. Uh, but... It is, uh, I mean, Washington is very gloomy because it's like hours late. Everything is delayed with the snow and the hail and the conditions on the river and so forth. And there's this description where he sits really gloomy and he writes later on, I mean, this was like I, I was ready to give up. But then he says, it, if we gave up, we couldn't get back. I mean, so we just continue now. And there's description when people come over on the other side, you can imagine how cold it is. It's brutal. It's the middle of the night. How they uh, then pull down fences on the other side and they begin to make fires. And there's one guy that describes that they were actually pretty excited. They were actually pretty happy to do something, um, uh, to be uh, on the move, although they had no real idea what they actually were going to do. Uh, uh, so, um, let me just see here, I'm just trying to jump over certain things. Um, so, one of the times they come to, let's just see one that is a little bit easier. Yeah, uh, let me give you another one that's a little bit easier. Um, let me get back here. I cannot see. Jacob's Creek, Can I read? Jacob's Creek, right here. So they're, they're come over here, and they're going down here, then they're going to split up in two and attack uh, from two sides. And they still expect that they don't know that the people down here couldn't come over. Right? So they still expect people to come from down here. So they have all kinds of problems because of this snow and ice. I mean, you have descriptions how one company from Canada, uh, where they have cracked shoes and they have no blankets and so on, how they can, it is called the Greenwood Company, how the Greenwood Company, they can follow them because they have blood in the snow. So the companies that come after them, they can see where to go because of the blood in the snow. And uh, despite they have been marching up from Canada, uh, just arrived two days earlier and have no shoes or cracked shoes, they're the ones arriving the first on the other side. Um, so it's, it's really rough. You can't see anything, and the nor'easter is really rough. So here you have a creek called Jacob's Creek, where it turns out because of the weather, you have one ravine, is that called a ravine? With water, boom, and then next to it, the water again is very steep. And that means you have to get all the artillery loaded off and put strings up to pull the artillery over the water. Uh, because you cannot just take the wagons and the horses. You have to kind of pull them over, over the water and so forth. And it's a very dangerous place. And uh, there's this story with George, with George Washington, of which there are many, but just to give you a flavor how the soldiers get to really admire this guy. George Washington rode up and down the column, urging his men forward. Suddenly, the general's horse slipped, 
and started to fall on a steep and icy slope. While passing a slanting, slippery bank, Lieutenant Bostwick remembered, His Excellency's horse's hind feet both slipped from under him. The animal began to go down. Alicia Bostwick watched in fascination as Washington locked his fingers in the animal's mane and hauled up his heavy head by brute force. He shifted its balance backward just enough to allow the horse to regain its hind footing on the treacherous road. Bostwick wrote that the general seized his horse's mane and the horse recovered. So if you ever had been riding a horse, I mean, it's a pretty good thing to do. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, after they had passed Jacob's Creek, uh, some of the, uh, he is quite incredible, um, the, uh, the um, uh, because he learns all the time too, he doesn't stay the same. He learns along the road uh, how to deal with the men, how to, what to do next, just one flank after the other. And uh, be, after Jacob's Creek, there's a number of men that falls by the wayside and freezes to death. You also have the story that a number of people here in the countryside, they uh, come forward, they want to join. Uh, here's the following story. One of the, uh, uh, you have James Monroe, who is a colonel, and he uh, comes by with a group of guys, a group of soldiers, by a house, and there's a lot of barking in the house, and the owner of the house comes out, and he's really mad. He thinks it's the British. And when he realizes it's the Americans, he um, said if he can join, he's a doctor, a surgeon. So they say, please, join. So this surgeon goes on to uh, Trenton with uh, Monroe, Mon the same Monroe that later become president. But if it wasn't uh, for this surgeon, Monroe would never become president because uh, at the Battle of Trenton, he gets very severely wounded uh, with the cutoff of one of the big uh, blood um, arteries. Yeah, arteries. And the surgeon is next to him, boom, and uh, make sure it doesn't, uh, the blood doesn't flow out and so forth and saves his life. This is a real story. So here you have this guy coming, uh, just marching through the countryside here, uh, James Monroe, uh, recruits a surgeon on his way that then saves his life. But a lot of people joined uh, along the road. So when you come towards Trenton, you have this really big hill. And you would think, great, because then we can just kind of glide down and so forth. But when you have uh, heavy artillery and so forth and a heavy storm, it's really difficult because you, if the artillery begins to uh, drive, it's, uh, so it's even it's more difficult than to go uphill uh, when you go downhill, uh, particularly when it's icy and snowy and so forth. So uh, when they're two miles from Trenton, it is now um, uh, 7.30 in the morning. And uh, 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 this is a whole story, it's a whole class in itself, the whole battle on, uh, on Trenton. They have, um, they have um, synchronized their watches, and within, when you come to Trenton, within three minutes, uh, Washington is very happy because they start the attacks, and I'm not going into all the details, and three minutes later, uh, they hear the other guys attacking two, and Washington is really elated. Wow, okay, we did it. We are on it at the same time. And they do take the Hessians with surprise, and the Americans inside Trenton start shooting out of the windows, including women and so forth, at the Hessians running. And uh, this is a big victory where the Hessians lose 918 men, 22 killed, 83 serious wounded, and 896 officers and men are captured. On the rebel side, you have two officers and two privates are wounded. That's it. So um, uh, they return that night. So they have been working all night, all the day before, getting over to icy uh, Delaware. They have been marching down here towards Trenton. They have been fighting a battle and it is still snowstorm, and they are going all the way back. And uh, this is rough. 
just a couple of examples. There's many stories about this, but this is just a couple of examples on the way back. Who is saying this? This is two different guys, just a part of the battle. I then went down to the river to wait for the boats. The ice was so thick near the shore as to bear for a rod or two. I went on the ice with a view to jump in, but it broke and let me into the river up to my waist, and the boat was filled before I could recover myself. The next boat, however, that struck, I waded into the river to meet it, threw my gun into it, made a leap with all my strength. I got in and got over to a fire, but almost dead with cold and fatigue. This is the next one. The ice continually stuck to the boats, driving them down the stream. The boatmen, endeavoring to clear the ice, pounded the boat, and stamping with their feet beckoned to the prisoners to do the same. And they all set to jumping at once with their cues flying up and down, soon shook off the ice from the boats. For Lieutenant Viderholt, the worst of it was the landing in Pennsylvania. His boat drifted two miles down the river, and the ice along the bank kept them from coming ashore. He and his men were forced to jump into the river and walk seventy feet through bitter cold water, then break an opening through the ice. They were nearly frozen by the time they got ashore. So, um, in leading into, uh, the British uh, had not really expected this. Um, uh, as I said in the, before we started this, that nobody except the officers knew what was going to happen. And Washington personally sat and made little slips as a password before the Trenton uh, campaign. And the password was liberty or death. And um, you had also that the officers, he was very hard, Washington. I mean, there was no, what do you call it, um, pushy stuff around him. Uh, what do you call it when you're soft? Mushy? Mushy, yeah. Um, so, but because his order before they started to the officers were that the password was liberty or death, uh, and that anyone that quit his ranks would be killed. And uh, the officers were to also have, the ones that were leading the divisions, should have a piece of white paper in the back of their head so that the soldiers could see who were the leaders. This is also so to ensure that they would be in the front of their men and not behind. So very kind of, um, uh, so you have Trenton is fallen and um, the, the, you have this, uh, takes 10 days for the news to get to Lowndon County, Virginia, uh, where you have a British land buyer, uh, Nicholas Cresswell. So this is Lowndon County. And uh, he writes on January the 6th, 1777, quote, news that Washington had taken 760 Hessian prisoners at Trenton in the Jerseys. Hope it is a lie. But then, um, and then the afternoon, he adds, this afternoon heard likewise taken six pieces of brass cannon. The next day, he writes, this uh, Brit from uh, Lowndon County, the news is confirmed. The minds of the people are much altered. A few days ago, they had given up the cause for lost. Their, their late su successes have turned the scale, and now they are all liberty mad again. <laughs> their recruiting parties could not get a man except be bought, uh, they bought him from his master, no longer than since last week. And now the men are coming in by the companies. So this is this bread from uh, Lowndon County. Um, and indeed, uh, things are shifting very fast. The, um, uh, now you have, if you put yourself, it's December the 27th now, and I would like you to put yourself in their shoes, in Washington's shoes. So his men have now marched and fought through rain, sleet, snow, snow, and tremendous storm. They've been on the road for 60 hours, okay? They're back uh, on the side of um, Pennsylvania. And um, 
in four days, you have many of the most trained regiments, they're going to go home for good because their time is over by, the, uh, 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 by now and they are, this is in their contract, they're going to go home. So um, Washington calls, so what would you do if you were Washington the 27th of December? The 1st of January, a lot of the troops are going to go home. Uh, the men has been out for 60 hours. Uh, the British for sure are going to react now. They have all these troops, they have food, they have horses and whatnot. And uh, so what would you do? So Washington has a council of officers. And it just turns out so that just before they meet, there comes a messenger to Washington that you remember the two other places where they were going to cross the Delaware? One of them was the Philadelphia Associates. These guys, they were wealthy people that was uh, originally created by Benjamin Franklin, these whole companies, that they have crossed the Delaware. And they really, they have a proposal to Washington there to drive the, the British away from western New Jersey. So this message comes just before uh, they have the council. So you have the people from down here, the Americans from down here, are on the side. They are in New Jersey now, marching up. And there's a messenger being sent to Washington, He's, who's over here. Look, uh, oh, over here. Uh, look, we uh, want to drive the British away from western New Jersey. So they have uh, a meeting, and um, they decide to prepare to cross the river again. This is after being out for 60 hours. And uh, the next day, December the 28th, Washington sends out uh, people on horses with a message, quote, I'm about to enter the Jerseys with considerable force immediately. I ask for the militia in North Jersey to arrest the enemy's flank and rear. And he also sent messages out to the militias in West Jersey in Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, asking them to send the militia and lead them and come as fast as they possibly could. So um, people from that time uh, like that participated with Washington, like Lafayette, Sherman, and others, said that if you just looked upon it, it was impossible that the Americans could win. I mean, the British had all this power, power firepower. They had all these uh, people. They had the food, they had uh, horses, but they were well fed. And the Americans was this motley crew uh, from all over the place, and uh, it looked like completely impossible. On December the 29th, so the, the, December the 27th, that's after they've been on this road for 60 hours, and they had the war council. Uh, the 28th, the message goes out from Washington, come and help. The 29th, in the morning, Washington crosses again on eight points over to uh, New Jersey, and uh, they are finished on New Year's Eve. And um, now he has another problem, Washington, because he, he wants to now occupy Trenton, but he has a problem, and that is that his best men are going to go home. Uh, and what to do? So he appeals to them. There is a meeting, and he calls the troops out in front of him, and he appeals, please stay, and please volunteer to stay, and nobody steps forward. Then he makes another appeal to them. My brave fellows, you have done all I asked you to do, and more than could be reasonably expected. But your country is at stake, your wives, your houses, and all that you hold dear. You have worn yourselves out with the fatigues and hardships, but we know not how to spare you. If you will consent to stay one month longer, you will render that service to the cause of liberty and to your country, which you probably can never do under any other circumstances. The drums rolled again. The sergeant recalled that the soldiers felt the force of the appeal and began to talk among themselves. One said, I will remain if you will, 
Another said, We cannot go home under such circumstances. A few men stepped forward, then several others, then many more, and their example was followed by nearly all who were fit for duty in the regiment, amounting to about two hundred volunteers. These were veterans who understood what they were being asked to do. They knew well what the cost might be. One of them remembered later that nearly half of the men who stepped forward would be killed in the fighting or dead of disease soon after. So, uh, one of the British leaders are marching towards Trenton. His name is Cornwallis. And he has 8,000 troops. And this is more than Washington could muster uh, with all the militias and so forth. And then also at Princeton nearby, you have the Hessians are joining up with Cornwallis. And the Hessians are ready. They are basically, we are not going to take any prisoners, kill everybody that we get, because they're also furious that uh, Washington had defeated the Hessians at Trenton. So, um, so, the, so George Washington gives, um, uh, has sent out a special uh, group of Americans uh, with the order, before they come to Trenton, your order is to harass the shit out of them, hold them back till sunset. I need the time to, to fortify and set up the defense of Trenton. So your marching order is hold them back. So you have this group of Americans, which is hilarious what they do. They harass the British so much that the entire British army puts up in battle formation twice, which takes a long time to do where they get so freaked out that they get orders to stand up in battle formation twice in one day, and the Americans then just run away. And then when the British gather themselves again, to get, then they begin to harass them from the planks, shoot at them, and so forth, like a bulldog that bites you in the ankle or something like that. So they really succeed. So in, in uh, uh, as they are just, so the British are in pursuit of these Americans that have been holding them back. And they are, uh, they've been very successful. Now the, the point is to get the Americans over a specific bridge, a Sumpik bridge. I don't know if I have that here. No, I don't have that here. Um, and not let the British over, but let the Americans come over. And it's a very crucial point. Uh, it's a very key moment in the whole uh, period in these days, whether this will succeed or not. And you have this, uh, again, Washington is in the smack middle of the battle. Uh, uh, to uh, keep people calm, keep people functioning, and get them over uh, the bridge. Nearly all of the Americans got safely across the creek. Howland wrote that, The bridge was narrow, and our platoons in passing it were crowded into a dense and solid mass, in the rear of which the army were making their best efforts. George Washington rode in and sat his horse quietly beside the bridge. Every man who crossed the bridge passed close by him. Private Howland wrote, The noble horse of General Washington stood with his breast pressed close against the end of the west rail of the bridge, and the firm, composed, and majestic countenance of the general inspired confidence and assurance in a moment so important and critical. In this passage across the bridge, it was my fortune to be, next, uh, to be next to the west rail. And arriving at the end of the bridge rail, I was pressed against the shoulder of the general's horse and in contact with the general's boot. The horse stood as firm as the rider and seemed to understand that he was not to quit his post and station. So it was just, they succeeded because he stayed calm. Otherwise, you could just have a total freak out and everything would have been a complete disaster because right after the Americans were the British. And the British first sent the Hessians. And uh, the Hessians marched over this bridge, uh, bridge and the Americans shot at them. And it was just full of blood, people f falling down. And as soon as uh, the Americans had killed one group of people marching over the bridge, the next group will come over and they'll be shot down. And after a while, the British gave up. 
and it was night, and the British gave up, and they couldn't really fight in the dark. They tried brute force to walk over, uh, send their soldiers over, and they were just killed and killed. So this that uh, they succeeded in holding the British back, just a little tiny group of Americans uh, succeeded holding the British back for a day, slowed them down, uh, was the entire Revolutionary War could have been lost if that had not succeeded. So uh, now there is a war council again. I mean, what would you do if you were Washington and you have all these British soldiers and it's impossible for you to hold it? I mean, what are you going to do? What would you do? Yes? There was not really any, he just uh, did one thing after the other according to just get things moving and do something, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. what would you do? I mean, your soldiers are tired. Uh, there's no way you can hold Trenton with all the British troops and so forth. So he had a war council. Just think about, I mean, it's, it was pretty wild. So what to do? <laughs> and uh, so there is, so he also, at that point, he get locals in to confer about what is the lay of the land and so forth. And they decide to uh, flee and to attack. See, this is what they did all the time in the Revolutionary War. They fled. They fled all the time. The Americans fled all the time. And then they attacked. Flee and attack. Uh, so they decide to flee and then um, attack Princeton and Brunswick. That was the outcome uh, with the locals. The locals will tell him, okay, here's what you do. This is possible. Uh, so that when the British comes with all their force towards Trenton, Washington pl uh, decides to sneak away and attack uh, with a big force a position that is much weaker of the British. So they made this whole spiel where they had fires and a lot of noise and so forth, and then they were packing the wagons in, behind, in, in the back, putting blankets around the wheels, they wouldn't make noise and so forth. So all night they packed up uh, and left. And you only had the few noisy people uh, to the very end out there at the banks. Uh, and um, so they, st they simply stole uh, away in the middle of the night. And here um, there's a whole bunch of other things developing which I will not go into. But this week changed the entire uh, Revolutionary War. Washington changed how things were being done in that one week that made uh, the rest of the Revolutionary War was conducted this way. A crucial thing that the history books don't write about is uh, what happened in January, February, and March. And this is something called the Forage War, where um, the... Uh, the, um, uh, Washington gives the order to his troops that most of them should join up with the militia. And in the beginning, Washington didn't like the militia because the militia was really independent. They would just do their own thing without waiting for a higher up order and so forth. But Washington has changed by this, by that time. And he now gets the regular army, so to speak, to work together with the um, militia from the different states. And their order is to harass the British. To The order is, quote, constantly harassing the enemy and remove out of their reach all the horses, wagons, and fat cattle and avoid general engagement. Just steal it. Make sure they cannot get food and uh, continue to do that. And there's all these stories. This is a whole thing in itself that you uh, this map is not very clear, but um, all these places where you have this, all these places <laughs> where this little scissor there, yeah. this is battles, forage battles, okay, for three months. And it's a real problem because the Americans take things also like for the British, to, for their horses to eat and so forth. So if you don't, so the horses, they, the British has to slaughter a lot of their horses because uh, when they have not to eat, then... They, it's better to eat the horses before, um, instead of them starving. The horses you need for artillery, <coughs> and they're really hurting. The Americans are flanking them again and again, really with American ingenuity, small group bands of Americans hiding in the woods, uh, hiding in the ditches, going out, attacking, shooting, and running away. 
And the British are really upset because they said, this is not right. This is criminals. These are bandits. You don't, this is not regular warfare. You can't do like that. <laughs> and they begin to have all these kind of, um, where when you go out just to get some food, they have like big uh, columns of soldiers and uh, ammunition and so forth to f defend themselves. And the Americans outdo them again and again and again. It's hilarious to read about because what the Americans do is like, uh, it's like some of the things that the Lima are doing today to kind of sneak in to do different things where you're not supposed to be and so forth and do things that you're not supposed to do. And I just want to have uh, one example from, uh, and what, one of the things that Washington also says which is extremely relevant for today, what we are doing and what, how Lynn is looking at the situation where, you know, sometimes Lynn has said, uh, we cannot really decide for too long ahead now. We have to see what is going on day for day at the convention, what is going uh, on after the, two, after the two conventions, what is happening in the world, and we intervene based on that, uh, flanking the enemy again and again. And Washington said, we are not going to be driven. We are in the driver's seat. We are not going to be drawn. We are going to be in the driver's seat. And that is the far towards of these three months. This is what they're doing. There's one example. Uh, of how, what the Americans do uh, to, and this is just one of these battles uh, out of ongoing for three months. These operations were well matched to the strengths of the Jersey militia, and they fought in a manner that continued to surprise British and American commanders. A remarkable event occurred on Monday, January 20th, 1777, near Abraham Van Nest's mill, two miles from Somerset Courthouse. General Philemon Dickinson led 400 Jersey militia and 50 Pennsylvania riflemen against 500 or 600 British troops at a bridge over the Millstone River. An eyewitness reported that the enemy had placed three field pieces on a hill about 50 yards from the bridge. When our men found it impossible to cross there, they went down the river, broke through the ice, waded across the river up to their middles, flanked the enemy, routed them, and took 43 baggage wagons, 104 horses, 115 head of cattle, and about 60 or 70 sheep. The British suffered 24 or 25 killed and wounded and 12 prisoners. Americans lost four or five men. There was not one single of these four, this is mine, there was not one single of these forage war that the Americans lost. Every single one of them, they routed the British for three months. Mm -hmm. And that was really a whole, uh, a very, very big uh, difference because um, um, you had, uh, you had, let me see here, Mm. In five, in, in, uh, in the, let me see here, uh, Howe lost 40% of his army and more lost, uh, by the end of the winter campaign, more than half of all, this includes also the, the Trenton and the uh, um, Princeton, by the end of the winter campaign, which goes into March when the first grass comes up and the horses can begin to eat the grass and so on, by the end of the winter campaign, more than half of all British and Hessian troops who had joined Howe's army in 1776 were killed, wounded, captured, missing, dead of disease, or so ill that they could not function. Half, okay? So you have this gigantic force uh, of the British well-equipped, well-fed. Remember I told in the very beginning 500 ships came in with uh, all kinds of foods and so forth from Europe. And after, uh, when you had this shift in the Trenton campaign in one week, uh, you had the shift uh, where um, Washington took the reins and uh, with intelligence, everything else, and uh, uh, started to drive the whole thing with the flanking and everything shifted. And then you had this irregular warfare, January, February, March, where alone there you had uh, uh, one-third in the forage wars of the enemy 
uh, was wounded or uh, couldn't incapacitate it and so forth. So you have uh, the British says about the Americans, one of the British says about the Americans, they seem to be ignorant of the uh, precision of order and order and even of the principles by which large bodies are moved. And then he can't go, continues to say, they, but they possess some of the requisites for making the troops, uh, good troops, such as extreme cunning, great industry in moving and of filling wood, activity and a spirit of enterprise, uh, which is a great advantage. So they can't really understand what the hell happened. Here by the spring of 77, although the Revolutionary War was going to continue, a number of the British leaders in the spring after this forage war uh, wrote in letters and so forth. They said that they did not think in, in the spring of 1777, they did not think they could win over the Americans, that this was a lost cause. So um, uh, that they thought the, uh, after the forage wars, when the spring started in 77, a number of the British leaders, you know, you can see that in their writing, in their letters, letter writings and so forth, they did not think that they could win. They thought that they could not win over the Americans. And they could not figure out what the hell had happened. The key thing is the Americans fought for higher ideas. And uh, I actually wanted to go through some of uh, the key differences uh, uh, in how the Americans fought, which uh, is very relevant for what we are doing today. That is, first of all, the Americans, they were fighting for, not for the sake of money like the Hessians and the Scottish Highlanders and so forth, but they fought for their country. They fought for higher ideals. They fought, they wanted to win and not just having a war, right? Mm -hmm. Also, Washington had a very high value of individual lives. He didn't want to kill uh, the enemy if he didn't have to. He preferred to take prisoners and he wanted to minimize the losses. Some of the enemy called him a wimp uh, because they were very brutal uh, with the American prisoners. Very much the same as you had the Confederates with the American soldiers during the Civil War where they treated the, uh, the, uh, the war prisoners. You remember Anderson Will and so forth where they treat them really disgusting. The same thing during the Revolutionary War which is an image of how you view men. So here you have the Americans having founded having uh, made the Declaration of Independence based on the enabled rights of man. And that is being mirrored in the way that the, for, uh, the war is being fought. And this is very, very specifically Washington. Sometimes when some of the people around him wants him to be more brutal, he says no. They have to be treated as human beings uh, if you take prisoners and so forth. Boldness, this changing of plans, just figuring out, having a war council, what do we do now? How can we outflank it, just being courageous? Tempo. I mean, uh, just taking the initiative and not be driven, but drive. Drive the situation, not running after the situation, but drive the situation. This is what, exactly what LaRouche is doing all the time, with one initiative after the other. And okay, now we have to do this. <laughs> and you can see how it drives the whole political situation with LaRouche's initiatives. And then speed. Washington's Continental Army with bad shoes and sometimes no shoes and lack of blankets and whatnot, they could far outmarch uh, the British and the Germans. They were fast, the Americans. And uh, also uh, the Americans would like you had with Princeton where all the British were concentrated on Trenton, or a huge part of them, and a smaller contingent was down in Princeton. Washington marched with his whole army to Princeton, so large concentration of force against the enemy's smaller force in crucial parts, so you win for sure. Uh, firepower, that is Knox, with his artillery out, there was a crucial difference in a lot of the battles was that the Americans had artillery, they had light artillery, and two to three times more than the uh, British, so they we could outgun them. And then, very, very important, good intelligence, where Washington personally recruited agents and had agents all over the place. And um, 
again, as I said before, the policy of humanity, the policy of you looking at people as being important, uh, so that after the war, 24% of the Hessian uh, went back and either stayed in the United States or uh, went back and took their families over. The Hessians uh, realized, wow, uh, but it took a little while to be treated decently. They couldn't believe uh, their own eyes or whatever. And um, they decided to, 24, one quarter of them decided to, uh, that America was the nation they were going to live in. I now have another section. I was going here, but I want to, yeah, yeah, but I want to um, tell you that I'm going to skip 12 minutes what I had, a very special thing, but it'll be too long. Um, what I want to do now is to go through what happens uh, 40 years later. And um, that is uh, that the young General Lafayette that I had shown you in the very beginning was 19 when he came to the United States. Oh, oh, this is just a little fun one. Cowboy? That actually comes. There was actually the Americans calling the British that stole the cattle. They called them cowboys. That actually where it comes from. Yeah. So I just thought it was a little fun thing. Uh, so remember I showed you Lafayette when he was 19, a, a, a picture of him when he was 19. And what I was going to do in this 12-minute into uh, loot, but I'm not going to do it. I was going to play the Florestan aria from Beethoven's Fidelio, because Beethoven was American. Uh, I mean, the ideas that created America was, came from a person like Beethoven, many other great Europeans, but Beethoven clearly. So Lafayette, after he had fought in the American Revolutionary War, was thrown in jail in Europe. He was supported, like John Quincy Adams supported him financially, his wife and so forth, when he was in jail and his family. His son George, who was called George after George Washington, came to the United States. He stayed at Mount Vernon at George Washington's house for three years. That is, Lafayette's son stayed at George Washington's house for three years. So they were very close. And uh, when um, uh, Lafayette, uh, uh, Lafayette is in jail in the 1790s, and in 1805, Fidelio writes his only opera. Uh, Beethoven writes his only opera, Fidelio. And this is about Florestan is Lafayette. Pizzario uh, is Pitt, uh, the, uh, Pitt the Younger in England. So it's very political. And uh, I'll just recommend you to, re, uh, to, to listen, uh, read the uh, libretto and listen very carefully to this opera. It's a very revolutionary opera. And it is, the hero in it is Lafayette, which I will now talk not as long as I've done so far, but I want to give as a strength in the pedagogical regarding what is very special about the United States uh, with the following. So you have uh, in 1824, Lafayette is being invited to come to the United States. He's being invited by James Monroe who, as I told before, was almost killed uh, going towards Trenton. He's president, and he's inviting uh, Lafayette to come to the United States. Uh, his secretary of state is John Quincy Adams, who is running for president. And John Quincy Adams said himself that uh, the trip that Lafayette did to the United States in 1824 was crucial, crucial in um, make sure, making sure that he became elected president and not a really scumbag Andrew Jackson. And it is very doubtful that if uh, Lafayette had not come to America in 1824 that John Quincy Adams would have been elected. If this is the case, it's very doubtful that Lincoln could have succeeded. So uh, I wanted to give an example of what actually happened when Lafayette came to the United States. He came here, uh, he uh, visited all 20, at that time now we have 24 states in the United States. Oh, forget about it. Anyway, <laughs> anyway let's go back to this. Um, and he visits all 24 states in 14 months. And what he is really impressed about is the prosperity that you have in the United States. 
the happiness and the prosperity. The prosperity is much bigger than uh, in Europe, and people are much freer. And with him, traveling with him in these 14 months is his son, George, who stayed in Mount Vernon for three years when he was in jail, and his personal secretary. And what you're going to hear a few quotes of the trip is from the personal secretary who every night he writes up what happened that day. So this is a European view of how America looks like and what's going on in America in this trip. Uh, namely the personal secretary to Lafayette. So he, um, uh, everywhere where he goes, he is like greeted by thousands of people. Uh, children are putting out, they're singing for him, they're putting out flowers wherever he goes. You have cannons um, wherever he comes into the city and the Hudson River and other, uh, other rivers. Cannons are indicating that he is leaving and indicating when he's coming. Sometimes people stay up all night to wait for him and to greet him in the morning when he comes. And um, what is, he's the last living general from the Revolutionary War. And um, people know the special relationship he had to George Washington. And what happens is very much what we are doing today, that he is reviving through his trip. General Lafayette is reviving the ideals of, uh, and the ideas for why the United States was fought for, what the United States represent. And this is what he's igniting throughout all the 24 states where he goes. And this is what makes sure that John Quincy Adams gets elected. So I tell you, it, this is a few examples. This is a 900-page book of descriptions of these uh, 14 months, where we're just going to take a few examples to give you a sense how he's being greeted. A lot of things we're not going to take up how Lafayette is very hard against slavery. He, uh, he muses about that regard because he also goes to the southern states, which are much poorer than the northern states. And he uh, gives uh, speeches about very openly when he travels why this is because of slavery. He has many encounters with uh, Indian leaders and in a group of Indian um, people uh, because he worked very closely with them also in the Revolutionary War which I'm not going to take up. So here's just a few excerpts. You should actually stay up here because it comes bang, bang, bang. Uh, so one of the places that he goes, of course, is Boston. And he describes how it takes a long time to uh, get to his district. Two miles takes two hours because people simply coming out en masse to greet him and to celebrate him that um, uh, it goes very slowly. And the mayor of Boston just a little section of what the mayor of Boston greets him with. You see this people for whom you have fought? It is happy beyond your hopes. Its liberty is assured. It relies now on its strength without fear and without reproach. You have shed your blood for three million men and 10 million move forward to you today. This movement is not one of a populace turbulently excited by the sight of the laurels that a young conqueror has recently won. It is the movement of a great people who yield to an impulse, solemn, moral, and wholly intellectual. So this goes again and again that they say, look, because what you did that you risked your life. He was mortally wounded in the Revolutionary War, Lafayette. Because of what you did, we are prosperous today. Uh, you made it possible. And they treat him like, uh, for example, he comes to a place where he sleeps in the bed that George Washington slept in. Or he comes to a place, I believe it's Baltimore, where they put up George Washington's tent. Uh, and that tent keeps following him, so they put up George Washington's tent so he can be in George Washington's tent. They present him with a cane from an apple tree where he had lunch with George Washington. So they're doing all these things. <laughs> and they have a, everywhere, like in New York, uh, always a little wild. So they have down, for those of you who have been in New York, uh, the Battery, down, uh, Battery Park, down in the end, they have a big celebration out at the water, the huge 
round thing with 1,000 torches, and 6,000 people are at the banquet. 1,000 uh, boats are in the river, and they have a party there. With the, they have a big statue of George Washington set up, a big statue of Hamilton, and then they have a celebration. They also have there, they have a big screen coming down with a picture of his home <coughs> place in France so he can feel really at home. So they have like some kind of a illustration. So, um, and then at midnight he's being put on a boat and then up the Hudson River up to the next town. So he also, also up in Troy, I mean, he loves the Erie Canal that has just been almost completed. And he travels 300 miles on it. And he comes to Troy, and um, he says, what is this? Has this kind of just come out of nowhere, like as from magic? Uh, because he then describes that when he was in the Revolutionary War, he was there, and he could hardly get a piece of cornbread and a cup of milk. And now you have a prosperous town. Uh, <laughs> so uh, he comes to Philadelphia, where... I'm going to have Rachel read this, and this is simply the description from every single city he comes to, how they do it. So just this one, and this is 14 months nonstop. This is Philadelphia. Never was it more truthful to say that the entire population had come to meet General Lafayette. Only those inhabitants whom age or frailty prevented from going stayed in their houses. Stepped rows of seats had been built on each side of the streets to the height of the roof in order to hold the spectators. In the principal street of the suburb that we entered, all the different corps of trades were drawn up in battle array, as it were. At the head of each corps was a workroom composed of some workers executing works of their profession. On the side of each of, each of these workrooms was a banner on which one saw the portraits of Washington and Lafayette with this inscription. To their wisdom and their courage, we owe the free practice of our trade. Among all these corps of artisans, one noticed especially that of the printers. Above a press set up in the middle of the street was this inscription. Freedom of the press, the surest guarantee of the rights of man. From this press pour poured forth abundantly odes to Lafayette and patriotic songs, which they threw into our carriage as we passed by. There's many descriptions where they talk about how they are crying, how they cannot keep back their tears, how they're very moved by what people are doing. And um, uh, I'm going to jump over, jump over the young girl. Um, one of them is what she was going to read. We are skipping that. Uh, there's also a description by this uh, secretary where they come to Bunker Hill, Bunker's Hill, and uh, there they have a banquet, uh, and they have this big silver bowl with all kinds of things in from Bunker's Hill from the battle there, like little buttons from people's uh, coats, knives, whatever it can be, all kind of leftovers from the battlefield. And they are actually giving each of them uh, uh, this secretary gets a little button with number 42 on and it's kind of rusty and all and he describes this is incredible these Americans I mean they venerate this uh, this is really they, with that to keep the flame alive for what America was fought for and so forth and in Europe we have this we, we have the veneration comes with ribbons and so forth but I like this much better than it, what we do in Europe. So you can see this reflection of this guy. Wow, these Americans, they're really... Um, he also describes how the Europeans say that the Americans are very aristocratic. And he said, That's, I don't think so. He, gives, uh, he said they are just very self-confident in what it is that America is, but they would like for everybody else to have this freedom and to have prosperity and so forth. Um, and he described at one point where um, uh, Lafayette is down one of the rivers and there's a lot of people on the boat and Lafayette, his son George and his personal secretary has one room in the ship uh, where they are going to sleep. And then they have a big party and John Quincy Adams, who is Secretary of State, he comes aboard the ship too to greet uh, Lafayette. And then when the party is over, the dining room where everybody has been eating is being cleaned up and mattresses, very simple mattresses, being thrown out on the floor for people to sleep. 
And uh, George Washington, or George, I'm sorry, George um, Lafayette is on, just wants to go out and have some fresh air. Remember, he had his room together with his dad and his dad's personal secretary. So at one point, he goes out to get some fresh air, and he sees there is John Quincy Adams, the Secretary of State, who is getting ready to sleep on the floor in the dining room together with all kinds of other people just there on the floor. And he does not want John Quincy Adams to sleep on the floor. So he goes and asks, can't you take my bed? And John Quincy Adams said, no. Then the person's secretary to Lafayette comes out, can't you please take my bed? And, Laf and um, John Quincy Adams says, no, I'm sleeping here on the floor. And uh, it's first after the committee that organized the whole trip uh, makes a formal inv invitation to John Quincy Adams that they put a false bed into Lafayette's <laughs> bedroom where Lafayette said, I personally would like John Quincy Adams to sleep in the same room that I'm sleeping in. So the, um, the secretary, of course, is completely, as a European, my God, the secretary of state sleeping <laughs> on the floor with all these other people. Um, so um, he also reflects on they come out up to the President Monroe. And uh, normally in Europe, it's very stiff concerning if you're talking with a leader, if you are at a dinner with a leader of a nation, I mean, it's all with wigs and all this kind of stuff, and it's very formal. And the only place that is designated at the table is to the right of President Monroe, that is for Lafayette. And everybody can just sit wherever they want to sit. Uh, there's also a funny description of the, um, of the ambassador from the King of Denmark. Uh, he's called Olesen. And he's completely freaked out because uh, he comes to the, see the president, and the president doesn't kind of indicate when he should leave. And he begins to feel more and more uncomfortable and so forth. And then the president asked him to stay for dinner. And at that time, he gets up and he rushes out and he leaves. And he then asks these other people in Washington, so what, the Americans, what kind of rules do they have for kind of conduct in the higher circles? I mean, totally, I mean, because you have the rules how you conduct yourself and so forth. So. You have these Europeans' reflections over these weird Americans. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, one of the, what I do want us, though, to go through is at one point, remember again that George Washington, uh, that George Lafayette stayed at Washington's house for three years when his dad was in prison, and how Lafayette was considered uh, George Washington's adopted son. And they go at a certain point, they go to Washington's tomb, uh, uh, Lafayette, his son George, and his secretary. And I just want to have this described. This is the secretary describing this tomb. <coughs> this one? Uh, yeah, from there to there, and then from there to there. At our approach, the door was opened. General Lafayette descended alone at first into the burial vault, and some minutes later reappeared on the threshold, his face inundated with tears. He took his son and me by the hand, made us enter with him, and with the motion of his hand pointed out to us the coffin of his fatherly friend. He rests beside the woman who was his companion during his life and whom death now joins to him forever. We bowed down together in front of the coffin, near to which we respectfully brought our lips. In getting up, we threw ourselves into the arms of General Lafayette, and we mixed our tears with his sorrows. And this is after they leave. After some moments of rest, we took the footpath that descends to the riverbank. Our walk was in silence. Each of us carried in his hand a branch of cypress cut from above Washington's tomb. We resembled a grieving family who was coming from putting a cherished father who had recently died in the ground. Already we were on board. Already the rapid waves had carried us far. However, no one had broken the silence of his meditation. Finally, Mount Vernon disappeared behind the winding and high banks of the river, 
Everyone drew near, formed a group on the stern of the ship, and listened attentively to Lafayette speak of Washington into the evening. So, um, uh, he goes to, he goes to all over the place, Maryland, they have a fair, and one thing that maybe we should revive a little bit is the Americans used at that time to make a lot of toasts, political toasts. And you actually have these recordings. I went to a museum in New York uh, with an exhibition of Lafayette's trip. And I mean, there was all these toast, toasts recorded. So this is an agricultural fair. And here's one toast from Lafayette. And you have to be very loud. Okay. <clears throat> to the seed of American liberty transplanted on other shores, stifled to the present time, but not destroyed by evil European weeds, may it be able to germinate and rise anew, more vigorous, more pure, and cover the soil of two hemispheres. So he was very clear that this should cover both hemispheres. Um, you have, uh, I'm going to drop over uh, Clay, okay. Uh, he goes to a CUS Congress, and the secretary describes that too, because in Europe, when you go to uh, the parliament and so forth, it's really pompous. I mean, to this day, you have this with the Queen of Denmark and so forth, with uh, six white horses and a carrot and <laughs> soldiers with things on their heads in the back and all this kind of stuff. Uh, to this day, this is happening, right? And uh, so here you have Lafayette, uh, and he goes to the U.S. Congress, and this is like a dozen of carriages, and uh, there's no pump or anything in it. There's quite some silence, and when people in the streets see who it is, they just are silent and take off their hats. And you have this very beautiful speech for the Speaker of the House, Clay, Henry Clay, who is the Speaker of the House at that time, to Lafayette. And... Um, Let's take another toast. Uh, this is a toast in the Congress to the Union. <laughs> they probably had uh, John Quincy Adams' favorite lemonade, okay? Um, well, for maybe a little context of what he's responding to. Uh, no, let's just take this because it's getting too much. Okay. The general rose and said, I should do the whole thing. Okay, you can do whatever you want to do. At this toast, the general rose and said, words, words to render all my respect and all my gratitude for the kindnesses which you are bestowing on me fail me. But I hope that you will do justice to the ardor of my feelings for America. Permit me to respond to the toast that has just been made with this. To the perpetual union among the United States. It has saved us in stormy times. One day it will save the world. So it's very clear what, also what Lynn is very clear about today, about the role of the United States um, uh, regarding this is not principles for um, for the United States, but for mankind as a whole, and this is to be planted uh, in the rest of the world. Um, the only thing, I think we do two more things. You have a situation where he goes to Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, he's just stopping by to get his horses some water, just to stop for a couple of minutes to just for the horses to be refreshed. And there comes an innkeeper out and pleads him, can you please come into my house? just for a few minutes. So Lafayette say, okay, and there's like thousands of these incidences. So Lafayette uh, goes in with his son and his personal secretary, and there they have set up, they have painted on the, uh, the wall with chalk, they have painted a welcome to Lafayette, and they have put uh, branches up from the wood, and then they have made a little table with brandy and whiskey and some bread, very simply ordered it, and asked them to refresh themselves. So while this is happening, uh, the innkeeper disappears and then he comes back. While we were having them, the innkeeper had disappeared. 
He returned a moment after, accompanied by his wife, who was carrying a young boy of three to four years, whose fresh and firm cheeks bore witness to the tender cares of which he is the object. The father first presented his wife to us, then took the child in his arms, and after having made him put one of his little hands in the general's hand, made him repeat expressively the following words. <laughs> General Lafayette, I thank you for the freedom that you have won for my father, my mother, for me, and for my country. While the child spoke, his father and his mother fixed their fond looks on the general. Their hearts were in agreement with the words of the child, and the tears that escaped from their eyelids against their will demonstrated how vivid and profound their gratitude was. If I can judge by what I myself felt at the sight of this scene, so simple yet so sublime, General Lafayette must have found this moment one of the sweetest of his life. He was unable to conceal his emotion. He embraced the child tenderly and escaped into his carriage where the blessings of this family, which was free and so worthy of being free, accompanied him. So you have many scenes like that where, for example, there's one scene where a, uh, a guy comes and says, look, my father died two days ago. I want to give you this. this is, and it turns out this was a sword that his father had gotten from Lafayette, and now he wants to give it back to Lafayette. You have all kinds of gifts being given to Lafayette on the trip. Um, and that's, that's a, tons of things to say about it, but I just wanted to draw out, I mean, they, um, uh, uh, again and again and again it comes out, the union is necessary not just for the United States but for the whole world. Uh, they talk about the eloquence of America, what is this, this very special, uh, uh, the pride and the beautiful title of being an American citizen. They talk about the Americans' special qualities, and uh, uh, I just, the last thing uh, from 524, uh, Lafayette gives a speech, it's the 4th of July, and just a short quote from that, and then I will end this section. I will also bless, by anticipation, the deliverance of the entire human race to whom the United States has given the first example of true and complete national freedom. Except, my dear sir, and all of you who press around us with so much enthusiasm and affection, please accept also the expression of my gratitude, my affection, and my respect. So when he leaves, um he gets a goodbye speech from the President of the United States, John Quincy Adams, which is very moving. And uh, he leaves America. And he, because, as I said in the very beginning, he revived the ideals upon which the United States was fought for. And he made sure that John Quincy Adams could be elected President. Um, uh, just a little note to end this is that he comes back to France and one of the first places uh, on his way home, he comes to the town of Rouen, which uh, kind of happens to be also the town where Joan of Arc was imprisoned and uh, burned to death. Uh, so he comes there and you have <coughs> thousands of young people come to greet him. And they are being mowed down and killed by the police. And he is back in Europe because this is the difference between Europe and uh, the United States at that time, uh, that in the United he's very amazed. There's these descriptions that he is to some of these huge celebrations that last for several days, and there's no robbery, there's no plundering, there's no rape or anything like that, and he cannot understand why, how come everything is so good here. Um, and then on his trip back to Europe, that's the very first thing he comes and he's being greeted uh, the way he'd been greeted in the United States, and the people are being uh, mowed down and killed by the French gendarmerie. So um, the last, and this will only take eight minutes, 
Mm -hmm. I had a much bigger program, but this is only taking eight minutes. I want to take it from here and again remind what I said because this is, I think it's very relevant for today, um, namely that what is it that is so special? What is so special about the United States? Um, why does LaRouche say this is a sleeping giant? Well, the last thing we had uh, uh, regarding the American giant, where it came to an expression, we had, as you know, we had Lincoln, we had FDI, and so forth. The last thing we had was uh, John F. Kennedy when he uh, uh, gave a speech in 1961 and said that before the end of the 1960s, uh, we are going to put a man on the moon. And as he said, this is famous, not because uh, it's easy, but because we, well, how is it now? Uh, it's hard, yeah. Uh, and then he takes up uh, that we have to, uh, hard, yeah, I have it there, but I'm not going to, I had several excerpts, but I'm just going to skip that. And then he says how we are going to, um, uh, uh, how big the rock is it's going to be, how tall it's going to be, how it's going to be, we are going to build, we have to uh, invent new metallic uh, alloys that we don't even know about to take the heat uh, and so on. We are going to do all, a lot of things in order to get there that we don't even know how to do, but uh, we're going to do it. And then you have, uh, I'm just going to end by showing you uh, this one, uh, which is after we've been on the moon and they're coming back and you already have a shift. You can see this guy there. This is Nixon who took us away. I mean, so Kennedy started it up. Nixon comes in and Kennedy is killed, as you know, Martin Luther King is killed, Bobby Kennedy is killed, you had Nixon. So you have the aftermath of what Kennedy put into being, but now you already have the shift uh, with the 68ers, the killings, the 68ers. Uh, and I just wanted, I think it shows very clearly, this is just when the astronauts come back from the moon, you can kind of see in their faces that they know they have done something historical. And that was the last gasp. Uh, until now, what we are doing today. So let me just. Why is it not starting? Again? The spirit of Apollo transcends geographical barriers, political differences. It can bring the people of the world together to peace. To protect against any possible lunar contamination, the astronauts put on airtight special garments before coming aboard the rescue ship. directly from the helicopter to a mobile quarantine van in which they would be flown back to the manned spacecraft center in Houston, Texas. I remember that. July 27th. The journey was ended. They were home again. Visits to major cities of America and abroad. 
The details of their unique mission would be relived and remembered so that others might learn what they had learned, and that future travelers in space might build upon their experience. So, now we the are... The lots of soil samples brought uh, Now we are in a situation where with uh, from uh, 1968, really 1970, when it really took off, where Lyndon LaRouche started this organization because he said when we get away from the, uh, when we are starting now building up this financial bubble, uh, this will be, this will mean destruction. And that was actually around that, that uh, LaRouche started this organization that we have today internationally. Uh, and in 1976, uh, in 1975, LaRouche wrote a program for an international development bank to issue long-term cheap credit for development in the third world, uh, calling for a new just world economic order. And ever since that time, we have had destruction of the real physical economy in the world. It has been going down, 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 and the bubble has been growing. Uh, at the same time, our intellectual uh, life uh, has come to naught. The universities are bunk, and we have had a total destruction of our, uh, our whole culture and our economy, where today there's a complete schizophrenia, uh, schizophrenic uh, split up between money and real economy, and people don't think in terms of conquering the space anymore. Um, but... The heritage is still in the United States. This is what we see today with the Puma women mm -hmm. and others. Uh, we have a situation where we can have a third world war, where uh, contacts I have talked with in the, in, the, uh, in the international community, they think war is inevitable. Uh, also Iran, don't forget Iran, uh, see the efforts for destabilization, and we can have a disintegration in a matter of a day uh, of the whole financial system. It's going right now. So in this situation, we are very similar. It's not the same, but it's a very similar uh, like what we uh, had with Washington, where it looked completely hopeless, but where people were wanted to do it if they had leadership and knew what to do. But today, our responsibility is global uh, and uh, for real. That is, if we, uh, not if we, we have to win this fight in the United States for the sake of the world. Uh, there is a heritage still from the fight, the revolutionary fight, which was ignited by Lafayette, which was ignited uh, with Lincoln. I'm just taking the high points, and again with FDR. And if you look at the time span from Washington to when Lafayette came, it's the same time span from FDR until today where Andrew Jackson could have won uh, the election. Uh, it was very tight. It was a very, very close race. Uh, and uh, we have a situation today where if we do, uh, if we follow our commander, Lyndon LaRouche, and we are not being driven, but we are the drivers, uh, uh, this American heritage uh, can be awakened, and we are awakening it right now in unprecedented ways. And it is being followed. I mean, the election campaign in the United States is being followed uh, as closely, or more closely, but definitely as closely in Germany, Denmark, India, China, uh, elsewhere in the world as it is in the United States. Everybody in the world are following the American election. And they don't really get it. I talk with a lot of foreigners. They don't really get, I mean, how can we get America back? Uh, this looks to foreigners as impossible. But if you begin to have a little, get a deeper sense of uh, how, what is the actual heritage of the United States, namely the ideas upon which it was founded, and this is what is being fought for, and this is for the world at large, uh, then uh, we can do what Washington did and what Lincoln did and what FDR did. It is in the heritage of the United States. And this is the genius of American culture. And that is where it is so important what we are doing with the intellectual work to put a total standard again, uh, because the American Revolutionary soldier were way <laughs> above uh, the British concerning 
uh, capability for reading and, and thinking. So that's what I wanted to say. Any questions? What's the mane of the horse? The mane, this is this. Uh, the horse have this thing down the back. No, 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 the mane. I'm a horse, okay? Here, this is the mane. Yeah, it's a pretty good job because he also had a big horse, okay? So if you ever have been riding horses, okay, this is quite a job to do. I used to do that a lot. My father was a uh, teacher in horse riding. Yes. Concerning on things such as, uh, you know, when we talk about it, it's, um, it's neoliberals, the people that call themselves liberals, and uh, they always point to like when the expansion of of America. They always point out, well, America was kind of dirty too, in terms of like the they, they kind of compared it to the British Empire. They said, well, we had this thing called manifest destiny, where we came in and we like raped. The, took the land, t took the Native American land and stuff like that. So in, in regards to um, this whole idea of, uh, of be able to, 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 to develop a nation on, on, the idea of, uh, on the idea that you want to develop every single person, not because of uh, what they look like or where they come from, but the, the fact that they're human. So my question is, how? How would I, um, when, when, you know, when encountering someone like that, how would I, I, I answer something like that? Like, what, what would be my response? In well, terms of no, I'm really happy that? you take this up uh, because um, every time you have, uh, like, for example, a real pig, I mean, you talk about the Indians, for example, um, and I'll just do it very short, and I can also tell you afterwards what specific things to read and so forth, but you have... Um, the real nasty stuff with slavery and the treatment of the Indians just driving away from their land and things like that came from the uh, forces in the United States that was completely linked to the British. Martin Van Buren, Andrew Jackson were nasty scumbags. I'm just reading this book right now, and I kind of normally like to read about the good people, and I read this book where there's all these nasty pigs, and it's totally clear that Andrew Jackson and Martin von Buren uh, were, for example, you talk about the Indians, and uh, every time you have, like, you take during the Civil War, you had the Confederacy. I mean, when the Confederacy seceded uh, from the Union, the Times of London had, the Great Republic is no more, uh, using uh, the, it, exactly the same forces that in the name of free trade, traded slaves were the one who in the name of free trade imposed opium on China. And when China didn't want to have opium, they crushed China militarily. And then they took chunks of China and so forth. So you have to, uh, this is also what foreigners have problems. When I say foreigners, I mean non-Americans today about what can be good about America uh, because of the torture, wiretapping, going out, uh, killing, uh, tens of thousands of Iraqis uh, and whatnot, huh? how can there be anything good in that? This is British policy. This is oligarchical policy. This is not what the United States represent. That's why I think it's so important that people really uh, get to really know uh, the, the Americans, the real Americans. I mean, a guy like John Quincy Adams, he was totally against the, the war against Mexico. He was totally against the treatment, uh, what later uh, happened to the Indians. He, or, he already in 1920 several times said we are going to have a civil war in, uh, in 1920, sorry, 1820, 40 years before it happened. He said we are going to have a civil war. It will be sublime. It will be all the question of slavery. So you have a very clear line that people that adhere for real in American history 
to the ideals of the Declaration of Independence and the preamble to the Constitution, they are not like that. It's all the people that are allied uh, either uh, directly or totally subverted, uh, don't even know what puppets they are. So it is, again, this fight on the one side and the other side. And today, there's been, like, ever since, uh, ever since the fought, uh, uh, that everything, ah, every t every s ever since we had a start of the Revolutionary War, which really started from uh, 1763, when all these taxes were imposed on the U.S. and so on, ever since then, there's been an effort to see if we can destroy the United States from within. And when, when uh, it, we had two good presidents, they were killed. Or all kind of dirty operations were done to uh, get rid of them. Like Martin von Buren, the role that he played in getting Andrew Jackson in, he was such a slime ball uh, that I'm just reading about him right now. It's like you cannot even believe what a slime ball he is, what sick, 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 sick old guy he is. And so we have written about it in some of the books we have given out. Uh, we have published um, uh, Treason in America and others. So it's really important to get as a very clear distinction. And one of the things is that the founders of the United States, they were clear, some of them more than others, like John Quincy Adams was completely clear uh, because he was in Europe for 20 years, that all the nastiness of Europe, the oligarchical tendencies in Europe and so forth, keep them away from the United States. But they snuck in here. Um, and to this day, I mean, that's what Tory went through. Uh, all nasty stuff that you now have with the control of the United States, it's British agents, uh, money from the oligarchy and so forth to subvert the United States. But I think, I think we really have to promote and study ourselves, American history, because it's only when you really begin to get it in your guts, so to speak, um, that you, on the one side, understand the importance of the United States, uh, and then the nasty stuff being done against it. And we have a number of classes on archive and a number of books and so on. Um, because this is really, this is really a battle for mankind. I mean, these toasts that that um, Lafayette gave, and he was not the only one, that this is for the world. Hopefully we can, we can get these uh, seeds and these ideals for the rest of the world. Uh, they meant that, and they fought for that. But for clearly, we don't have it. But we actually have a situation today that is so horrific and global that we actually have a chance and we can really smash oligarchy today. Uh, and render it very impotent because this fight is global. We really have a situation now, a mass genocide in the world, or uh, we, the American ideal will win. Yes. Well, I read that this was a guy who, uh, I just read it the other night. I forget his name now. This is a guy who had, as he could not uh, 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 read himself. He could not read. It's actually the only case you ever had in history, according to this book I read, where he had then, uh, the Cherokees didn't have a written language. And he then uh, made up, I forget it was 60 or 80, uh, characters or whatever that would um, make the sound of the uh, Cherokee language. And that's when they uh, started the first uh, uh, Cherokee newspaper. But this was this Indian who did it. Yeah. Is that under John Quincy Adams' presidency? Uh, I don't remember. It was either under him or Andrew Jackson. See, right now I'm reading about Andrew Jackson. So it's either or, I don't know. But what happened there, it was totally nasty Andrew Jackson stuff. Yeah. And that's why it's very important to see because it was not just America. It's like uh, uh, Lyndon Rouge doesn't want to torture people or attack Iraq and so forth, and a number of good Americans did. So this is not America. What is happening in, uh, with American foreign policy and internal policy, that is not American policy. 
And that's, we have to make sure, like you and I, we have to make sure that American system is what wins inside the shores and outside. And not this uh, brutish uh, thinking about man. I mean, you, you know it. I mean, when people want to slash health care and, and uh, laws read mark that wants to have uh, only 5% of people learning to read and all this kind of stuff, and you know what view of man they have. I think also the problem is when you look around in the culture today, um, outside of this room, that is pretty brutal and pretty ugly, and that's where we have to really nourish what is real. Are you, are you satisfied or you want? I thought it's a very important question, but it just takes a lot of work to really get what it is to be an American. Yeah. And I know that because I am European. <laughs> so <laughs> it took me a lot of years. Uh, to, and actually, I'm as young as you as an American because I came here a couple, 22 years ago. So I don't know how old you are, but you are around there. Yeah. And uh, so I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand where LaRouche came from. I was totally pro-American because Danes are very pro-American, but I couldn't figure out when I came here, I, could, I mean, where did LaRouche come from? Because it didn't make sense. And I, could, I only began to understand it when I began to study the great figures from the past and really study them. Then, oh my God, this is America. I was so dumb when I came here that I um, had thought Denmark, my country, is 1,000 years old. So why should I study American politics? Because America is only a couple hundred years old. I mean, that's, that's what I thought. And this is being a leading member of the LaRouche organization that I thought like that. As a total European snot ass. <laughs> and knowing nothing, right? <laughs> yeah, whatever you can say. <laughs> whatever. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, so it takes a lot of work. And, but it's very, very... Uh, you really get a much more appreciation of the whole world. I get, have much greater appreciation of my country today after I got to know what America is all about because it gives hope for the whole world. Uh, that if we have American ideas,